I want to thank you all for joining us here today. My name is Trinity. I'm a speech pathologist and augmentative communication specialist with Bridging Voice. And we have quite a few of our team members that are joining us here today, which is lovely to always have some backup and support. I encourage everyone to participate at whatever level you need to. Please con uh, consider muting your microphone so that you are not talking at the same time that I am talking. Um, we have a chat uh, feature as well, so please feel free to ask any questions. If it's appropriate, I'll jump in and answer your question on the spot. Now we'll save it till the end. We also have Lane, another one of our speech pathologists with us, and she will be my tech assistant today, dropping links for you in the chat window. So having that open sometimes is helpful. Um, and she will kind of also be kind of directing the flow of if I need to stop and answer a question or a technical difficulty. Lane, you didn't know you had all of these big jobs today. But I want to thank you. Um, I am very excited to talk to you guys today about eye health. So looks like we've got the majority of everyone here. Let me go ahead and share my screen and let's get started. All right. Okay, I'm going to just do a little rearranging here. A little cumbersome, I apologize. Perfect. Okay, we got it. All right. So I have to admit, um, I have definitely been that friend that can't stop talking about uh, eye health. Um, it is something that our Bridging Voice team has really focused on this year. And I think one of the things that's so important about this is that it has it has such a small lift from a caregiver standpoint of view or a person with ALS, a person living with ALS standpoint of view, but the difference that it makes is absolutely mind blown in some cases. Um, and so I cannot wait to share this information with you all. Um, and I do hope that you ask any questions that you might have. We are absolutely open to discussion. Um, and then I hope afterwards you take this information and you spread it far and wide because nobody is talking about that um, except for us. So I am really excited to be able to share this with you. So thank you again for joining us today. I health seeing is achieving. Today is July 30th. 2024, and you are joining us here with Bridging Voice. So quick introduction in case you're new about who we are. We are a small but really mighty team. Six speech pathologists, one OT, two amazing programmers, and our amazing leader as well. And, and this number is pretty staggering, and I have to tell you, it keeps climbing. We have assisted over 2,700 people with ALS in 49 states, North Dakota, we're still looking for you, um, and 21 countries. And I have to tell you, this number keeps increasing, um, which is absolutely such a gift that we have been given to be able to provide support to so many people. But what do we do? Uh, we specialize in customizing communication software and access, innovations, mentorship. So if you're a speech pathologist, um, in need of a little extra support to provide services to your uh, clients with ALS, we are here for you. And of course, education, which is my big uh, bread and butter. But here's the most important thing I want you to know. Our services are always free. And honestly, there's one of us most days, most hours of the entire calendar year. All right, so let's do a quick recap just to make sure that we've got everyone on board because we have people of all different kinds of different communication levels, so uh, as well as professionals on this call. So let's start with eye tracking. So eye tracking is used by a majority of people with ALS because they lose their ability to uh, move their uh, extremities to be able to access a computer or to technology in general. Um, and for a lot of people, uh, especially as they progress through the journey with ALS, it is their only form of communication and connection to the outside world. So it is very important that we make sure that we keep and maintain that ability for them to be able to communicate using eye gaze. So 
how does it work? A lot of people ask this question. So you actually can see on the slide at the bottom left-hand corner, this happens to be a Toby um, eye gaze bar. And there are a lot of different companies that uh, that make communication devices and that make eye gaze. Um, this just happens to be a Toby. So what it does is you can see in the picture, the little glint um, in the eye of the, uh, in the eye, uh, in the pupil. And uh, what that does is actually the camera is watching that shiny glint to be able to tell where you're looking. And it's a reflection of the IR um, from coming from the camera, the red lights emitting an IR signal being reflected back by the surface of the eye. The most important thing is, is that you have to have a moist, shiny surface to your eye in order for that glint to come back at the camera and the camera to be able to see it. So that is absolutely laying the foundation. You must have a moist eye to get a shiny reflection for the eye gaze camera to be able to see. All right. So why are we talking about eye health? Many of you who are people living with ALS have probably never heard a professional talk about eye health in relation to ALS. And many professionals that are listening have also not talked about it. Why are we talking about it now? The reason we're talking about it now is because we feel at Bridging Voice that it is very, very common that somebody who has, who's living with ALS and using a communication device, their eye health is impacting their ability to use their communication device. Now, let's talk about something that's really important, which is symptomatic versus asymptomatic. Symptomatic means I say to you, hey, Nachum, I can no longer use my communication device. Oops, I apologize. I can no longer use my communication device. My eyes are so dry and so itchy. I don't know what to do. Okay, that's symptomatic. I'm telling you that there's something wrong with my eyes. Asymptomatic means I'm not telling you because I don't even realize that there's something wrong with my eyes, or I don't even realize that this is something that I should be talking to you about. There's a lot of other things we talk about, but this oftentimes is not one. So symptomatic, I'm telling you there's something wrong. I know there's something wrong. Asymptomatic, I don't even know there's something wrong. So I would like to show you these three eyes and all of the pictures that are being used here have been given with permission to be able to use. I will not be using their names, but I will be sharing. So all of these are dry eyes. Now, the one on the lower left, this eye is obviously dry as well as over dry to the point of having an infection. So that's like the far end of the spectrum. But these other two, would you suspect that they have dry eye just by looking at them? No, probably not. You would not. But in fact, both of these people have severe dry eye that we have been working on treating. So this is where I want to show you. Lower left symptomatic, the, two, the top and to the right, asymptomatic. You wouldn't even think to consider addressing dry eye with these two individuals. So let's talk about these symptoms of dry eye that someone that you may be experiencing and know, or that you may not even be, that you may be experiencing and not even know. So of course, redness, dinging. Here's a big one, light sensitivity. A lot of us who work in the ALS, augmentative communication device world, just assumed that light sensitivity was all the results of ALS. Well, I'm here to say, I want you to stop and rethink that, okay? Again, this is a symptom of dry eye watery eyes, mucus near the eye, for example, like in the corner of the eye, blurry vision. And here's the last one. This is the most important one. It is the difficult difficulty accessing eye gaze communication device. We immediately start thinking about, is the lighting right? Is the positioning right? What's going on? But what we don't stop to say is, are your eyes dry or are they not? So now, what causes dry eye for somebody with ALS? Okay, let's talk about this. First one off the bat, medication. Allergy medications, 
saliva reducing medications. Both of those can dry out the surface of your eye, okay? Non-invasive ventilation, such as you see the gentleman here using, for example, nose pillows, BiPAP, CPAP. Again, a lot of times as we know, especially as you try to talk or even just move your mouth, or sometimes when you're sleeping, your jaw comes open and then your mask starts to leak. And usually one of the first places it wants to go is right up the side of your nose and into your eyes and then just blows across the surface of your eye. Here's another important thing. History of eye surgery, including a Lasix and including a cataract surgery, all right? A lot of speech pathologists do not ask um, if there are, you know, what medications their clients are taking in relation to this. They also don't ask um, if they have had a history of Lasix or of cataracts. And then uh, and another two other really important things. Number one is an inability to blink. So oftentimes as your journey progresses with ALS, your ability to blink decreases, okay? And what I mean by that is it's not just about how well, like, does your eye completely, your eyelid completely cover your eye, but how well do you actually close your top lid and your bottom lid together? A lot of times I'll see pals that get very close, but don't actually make the connection between the top lid and the bottom lid. And then also reduced blink rate. As you know, with using a communication device, one of the most common methods with eye gaze is dwell, which is where you stare at it for a period of time and you have to wait for the circle to go around and then it selects, okay? As you're learning, oftentimes we make that dwell time much longer so that you don't um, have a tendency to uh, select things that you don't wanna select. So that being said, um, you're trying to learn and you're staring and you're not blinking, okay? The other thing too is that you are now using computer screen in front of your face from the moment that you wake up until the moment that you go to bed. That is also really hard on your eyes. Even for somebody who has a very nice blink, that's a long time to be staring at a computer screen. So how can we how can we see dry eye if somebody isn't reporting dry eye what is tipping us off to say i wonder if we've got something going on here mm -hmm. let's talk about that so let's talk about what is a track status or a positioning guide you'll see here in the slide i have a positioning guide and a track status so the one on the left it, uh, you will commonly see within the toby dynavox products Okay, so you see the two eyes in the center of the screen. Those are supposed to represent your eyes. On the right-hand side of the screen, you see colors, all right? And you see a little triangle in the middle. And if you get too close to the screen, that triangle is gonna move up towards the red. And if you get too far away from the screen, that triangle is gonna drop down to the red. Conversely, the one next to it is often what you see within um, grid three. So you'll see a face in the center. Some of their cameras do as well have the distance indicator. Um, some of them do not, but you will see a face in the middle of the screen and you'll see the eyes kind of move back and forth. Um, you'll also see the colors within the face. So if you get too close, the face gets really, really big and turns, turns red. And then if it's too far, conversely does the same thing. So what you can see oftentimes from dry eye is you'll see the eyes flickering in the track status. So I've got really nice, good presentation, but one eye will kind of go in and out. Yes, I have been practicing this just in case you were wondering. You'll see the eyes kind of go in and out. So you'll see the white dot appear and disappear. And then the same thing on the little smiley face next to it. This is the, this here is like one of the biggest indicators for me. It's the, the distance moving. So your client is sitting perfectly still all of a sudden you see that distance indicator. So whether it's the slide bar down the side or whether it's the face turning colors, nothing's moving. Computer staying the same, person is staying the same, and you're seeing that distance indicator coming in and out. That is telling you that the computer is losing that glint, okay? Also the cursor jumping across when it shouldn't be. Okay, so for example, if you're looking at one spot and then you kind of see it wanting to jump around, 
that is an ind indication that you should consider dry air. There are multiple other things that, that, that actually can affect that, but that's you should consider it. And then also a difficulty selecting across the entire area of the screen. Um, for example, you know, you've got the positioning correct, but they, they're trying to select up here and they keep going and you really see it jumping up here, despite the fact that you've got them in an, or you're in a good position. Okay. I would love to show you this video. Let's cross our fingers and hope that this video plays as it should. I want to show you this video. In this video, I'm going to preface it to tell you guys what we're what I'm what we're asking the client to do, and then we'll watch it together. So what we're asking the client to do is to start on the left hand side and just work their way across selecting buttons across the keyboard. This is a very classic, what we call QWERTY keyboard because it starts with Q W E R T Y. All right. So let's just watch and see how they do. So they're trying a S D. Now they're trying to go for the F. Not happening. See how it wants to keep popping up. I think we've all experienced this. They're trying. Now they're going to go for the G and it's not working. I'm going to clear all. Okay. Oops. Okay. Now, here is the power of a hydrated, shiny eye surface. Okay. Nothing has changed. Absolutely nothing has changed other than we asked the caregiver to give this person an eye drop. That's it. Okay. Watch the difference now. This isn't a different day. This isn't a different position. This is not a different speed. The only thing that's different is an eye drop. That's pretty amazing. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about treatments for dry eye. I put it in really big font because I want you all to remember Eye drops, eye drops, eye drops. I cannot say it enough. I should have owned stock in eye drops, but unfortunately I don't. So I want to talk about two things related to eye drops. When should you start and what kind of drops should you use? Okay. Now at the bottom of this slide, I want to be very clear that the recommendations that we're going to give you today, okay, should be used as a guide to discuss with your physician, all right? We are not a medical professional to be able to give this information. I want you to talk with your med medical team about which eye drops are correct for you. So let's go with the very first statement. And this is where we need to work together to get the word out. And this is where the advocacy piece comes in, okay? Every person with ALS who uses an eye gaze communication device should be using eye drops to ensure hydration from the very start, okay? If you are given a communication device or if you are a speech pathologist who's handing out a communication device or if you are somebody from an AT loan closet that's handing out a device, we should be ensuring that every one of our people living with ALS who's using a communication device has started to address their eye health. Do not wait until it becomes symptomatic. Do not wait until your eyes are so red that you can't use a communication device because to be able to repair the surface of your eye is much more difficult than just starting from the very beginning by using consistent eye drops. I cannot say this enough. It is absolutely life-changing. Okay, so from the very beginning, you should be using eye drops. 
the question is, what kind of drops should you be using? Okay. The most important thing, when I'm going to go over this again, the most important thing about what kind of drops you should be using, please, 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 if your budget allows, please use preservative-free eye drops. Okay. Very, very important. I want you all to know, I'm going to say this out loud. I want you all to know that all of this information is going to be in a handout for you. Okay. You, at When we are done with the training, we will give you an after training email and you will have everything that I'm talking about today in a nice handout for you to have for your own reference, as well as for you to share and spread far and wide. Okay. So you don't have to worry about writing stuff down. I've got it all written down for you. So starting off with a just a straight up saline drop. Okay, absolute wonderful idea. The drops that are listed in italics, such as the Theratears, the Refresh Cellufisk, the Sustain Hydration, these are drops that we have used and that other people with ALS have reported to us that they were successful with. Um, it doesn't mean that it's the best. Again, use this as a point to have a further discussion with your with your doctor or your physician, okay? So just a saline drop. We're gonna start at the top. At the top are the thinnest, and as we work our way down, they become thicker and thicker, or what we call viscous, okay? The next row is gonna be your viscous drop. That's also what's called a lipid drop, or I'm sorry, a viscous drop, I apologize. So the viscous drop um, is has a, has a little bit thicker, so it stays on the surface of your eye a bit longer. So if you're finding that you're using saline drops and you need them like every 15 minutes, every half hour, maybe you want to consider trying a viscous drop that's a little bit thicker. Now, the saline, the viscous, and then our next one down, the lipid drop, all of these do work with eye gaze. They do not impair your ability to use your eye gaze. Okay, they won't get in the way of your camera. The viscous and the lipid emulsion drop sometimes can leave your vision just a little bit fuzzy for just a for just a few seconds. You can just kind of blink a couple times or just kind of sit for just a minute if you're unable to blink and your vision will clear up and you will be able to see your communication screen much clearer. Okay. Now let's talk about the third one down, which is the lipid emulsion drop. Okay. Now in this case, I can just tell you, it's like a fat or an oil. All right. So before when I was talking about your eyelids, it's really important that your top lid and your lower lid come together because you have oil glands that are on the bottom of your, on your, that are on the edge of your lower lid. So when the top uh, eyelid comes down to the bottom one, it heats up for just a second. And then what happens that is when you open your lid back up again, actually pulls a little bit of an oil across the surface of your eye to keep your tears from evaporating away. So if you are having a hard time with getting your lids together, consider a lipid or emulsion drop because that will help to kind of keep the your tear layer in place on the surface of your eye. Okay. Um, all right. Let's talk about ointment. So ointment is, this is where uh, it does impair your ability to use your eye gaze camera. Um, so an ointment, as you know, is very thick, kind of like a neosporin in this sorts of a case. And if you do use them, have a conversation with your physician, like, can you alternate so that you keep one eye open so that you can communicate? Could you possibly use this at night so that your vision is not impaired um, by your ability, you know, does not impair your ability to use your communication device? If you do need to have um, your eye, in fact, with ointment, um, please make sure that you have another communication system in place, such as a wireless call system um, and or a manual board, like our manual partner scanning board. Super important for you to have in place. I don't want you to be without the ability to com communicate. Okay. What drops should you avoid? Okay. Again, please avoid, if your budget allows, drops that are not preservative free. You're using drops at a really high rate over a really long extended period of time. And the, pre um, the preservative formula can actually dry out and or irritate your eye. 
the second one is allergy drops of any variety. Okay. I intentionally took the name of this one off because I didn't want you to get stuck that it was just one. Any, any variety. Um, we have we have um, seen extensive um, instances of people who were able to use their eye gaze and then use an eye drop and that immediately stopped their ability to use their communication device because the eye drop was in fact an allergy eye drop, which was meant to dry up your eyes so that they're not so watery. Okay. Um, Lynn, I'm going to totally, I'm going to talk about your statement just right now. So Lynn said, uh, my tear ducts, both of them are plugged. There are no simple solution. You're right. Um, it is challenging. Now, some people have in fact talked about what's called punctal plugs, which are, you know, plugs that you put into your tear duct. The problem oftentimes is, is that then you'll get a pooling of tears at the bottom of your eyes. But if you're having a hard time moving your lids, then what happens is, is that you don't, your, your top lid doesn't come down to that pool then to pull the liquid across the surface of your eye. So again, coming back to teardrops to keep the surface of your eye moist is absolutely imperative to keep that glint going to use your communication device. There are some other options, Lynn, you brought up one as a matter of fact, which is the punctal plugs. The other one are compresses. If you have eyelid issues, or um, yeah, eyelid issues, changes in medication, talking to your uh, physician about, for example, could you look at another option to control your saliva rather than a medic an oral medication, and then scleral lenses. Now, scleral lenses is a whole other conversation, and we will actually be, um, Nachum and I will be giving a presentation on scleral lenses on the 20th of August. So please consider joining us for that. Um, uh, Lane will drop the chat, uh, will drop in the chat a sign up link to that if you would like to learn more about that. So let's talk about, um, let's talk about this, eye, this idea of eye health and advocacy and being able to share it. Now, you know, you're coming to learn something brand new that a lot of other clinicians uh, or your doctors uh, may not be thinking about. So we have made this eye health guide that you can see here. Um, and we would, and you're going to get a copy of it. So if you do want to do self-advocacy to be able to go to your clinician or talk to your speech pathologist or your AT person and say, hey, I'm wondering if this is why I might be having a hard time. What do you think about this? We wanted to share this with you for you to be able to share far and wide. Okay. So I left a lot of time here because there's going to be a lot of conversation regarding all of this. So I left a lot of time for us to be able to talk through this. Um, I really, I want to share and um, I'm going to share on Nacham's behalf because Nacham shared this with me. He learned about eye drops many, many, many years ago. And, and he kind of pushed to the side saying, no, no, we can't, it can't be that important. It can't make that much of a difference. It's gotta be something else. It's sometimes when you overlook something little because you're looking for something bigger, it's gotta be the lighting. It's gotta be this, it's gotta be that. And the truth of the matter is that when he came back around some years later and then shared the wisdom with us as we all started working together on identifying people um, who this is really impacting because so many people, again, are asymptomatic, which means they're not able, they're not, they don't notice that their eyes are even dry. It wasn't until then that Nachum has said, I wish I would have taken that to heart many years ago. And also that, yes, this is actually such an impactful thing um, in terms of the intensity of what eye drops can really do for somebody in terms of maintaining their ability to communicate. Now, that being said, I can tell you, we have many times received referrals for people and we were told that this person no longer can use eye gaze. We need to help them find something else. Um, or we have received referrals of we've tried every eye gaze camera and we just cannot get it to work. Or we'll have clients that say it was working great. I can tell you this always happens in the springtime. We'll get 
few clients that will be like, I was using my communication device perfectly. And now all of a sudden I can't. So either nothing works, I was using it and it doesn't work anymore. And the first thing we will say is, tell us what has changed with your medicine. Are you taking allergy medications? Are you taking saliva medications? Again, going back to those medications. Have you recently had pneumonia and you were in the hospital and they gave you something to help you dry up your lungs? Again, all of those things are very indicative and we'll start right there, okay? But this is so new that we need to spread the word throughout the ALS community. We wanna start with you guys and then have you start spreading the word so we can all pay attention. The problem is, is this oftentimes falls into the middle. We talk about interdisciplinary clinic, but this really falls into the middle of speech pathologists are not aware of dry eyes in relation to communication devices. Uh, the respiratory therapist doesn't, or pulmonologist doesn't think about the mask blowing into the eyes, causing dry eyes. Um, the neurologist oftentimes don't think about the, the saliva medications causing dry eyes. And to be, and there's not usually an ophthalmologist or optometrist, you know, involved with ALS clinic. Um, and it's very difficult to get to a uh, eye care professional and they don't make home visits. It's very hard. I've heard of a few in the entire country, but not very many. So we have to work together to advocate for ourselves to make sure that everybody is continuing their ability to communicate throughout their disease process um, and starting from the very beginning, which is getting you started with keeping your eyes healthy. Because oftentimes this is the last point for somebody for communication. You just need to keep their eyes healthy. So I would like to share with you um, an absolutely wonderful, wonderful um, testament to from one of Elaine's clients. So I use a Toby Dynavox eye series for eye tracking. While it is great, I always hope to be able to speed up the dwell time to be more productive. The challenge was always the little jitter. So that little shake that you get between the letters. Uh, during a call with Lane, the recommendation was preservative pre eye drops. After switching my current eye drops, I was able to dec decrease my dwell time by 30%. I now feel control when using eye gaze. I wish I had known this sooner that eye drops could have such an effect. And that last sentence is what's so important, which is why we continue to bring this forward. So Robert shared that with us and I can't thank him enough. I wish I could uh, share all of the videos that we have of our clients um, with eye drops, uh, talking about eye drops and what a difference it has made for them. Okay. <clears throat> so. That I'm going to stop with eye drops for just for a second, and I'm going to go into some further trainings, okay, that are coming up. And uh, the reason I want to bring these forward is because our very next one, like we talked about, August 20th, see something, say something, scleral lenses in September. This is an absolutely wonderful presentation. Um, what to expect um, in a communication evaluation for people with ALS, all right? That is important for speech pathologists uh, as well as for clients. And then in November, uh, we have Every Word Matters, which is an update on voice preservation strategies and using your voice with a communication app software. As I alluded to before, if you want to go back and, and, and re-listen to this conversation, you can find all of our trainings on our YouTube website. Um, you can also um, if you want to share this training with somebody else because you want them to be able to see it, again, you will be able to find it. And you will have a direct link that will be sent to you in your follow-up. All right. If you joined us and uh, are wanting professional development att attestation, please fill out the attestation form found in the Zoom chat. So Lane's going to drop that. Um, so she dropped the sign-up links for our upcoming trainings, and she is going to drop the link for our attestation attendance. For That's for professional development, if you need it. All right. So I'm going to stop at this point, and I'm going to welcome everyone to turn on your cameras, turn on your microphones. 
whatever you need. And if you have any questions, our team is here. Nakam has joined us as well. We have Lane, we have Deborah, we have, I think I saw Eddie, uh, Abby is here. So please join us, uh, ask any questions that you might have about eye health or eye gaze in relation to that. We are welcome and open. All right, our first question is, is how often do you use eye drops? Okay, so that question is actually very personal. But what I do wanna tell you is, you should be using eye drops way more frequently than what you think you need to be using them. So there are some clients that we have that use eye drops every 15 minutes throughout the entire day. They really happen that frequently. Um, one of the things I would love for you to start to pay attention to is what do your eyes do when you don't use an eye drop? You'll very clearly see, for example, that you're consistent and then maybe after 15 minutes to 30 minutes, you might start jumping around. Your distance indicator might be coming in and out. So really being able to see those things that are important. Um, there's also times of like, for example, if you do need to take oral um, medication to help control your saliva, you know, when that medication is in is in peak view uh, or peak use, you're gonna be drier. And so you're gonna need to use it more frequently. So Lynn has a question is, please review what happens when your eyes are too wet. Malcolm, do you want to jump in with that one since you're here? So I, then, yeah, too much moisture also confuses the eye tracker because it's actually going through um, uh, a pool of water. Um, I, there are questions on that, why that happens, because we do know that people using scleral lenses that have an entire pool inside, they are able to eye track well, but that's what we found that it's the, it's the, like, I guess the inconsistency of that pool of water, it just distracts the eye tracker. Eric, you were asking Very if there was- though, oh, sorry. Just important to mention that people who have a watery eye is another indication of dry eye, just like a super important thing, which is so counterintuitive. But uh, that's like one of the, that's one of the things that sends a lot of people to the ophthalmologist and then they find out that they have dry eye. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Eric, you were wondering about a device to help with putting in eye drops. I'm assuming that you, and I can see you, so you can shake your head if you want, but I'm assuming you're talking about like, it's difficult for you to actually squeeze the bottle, right? Yeah, okay. So yes, there are some adaptive ability. There are some adaptive eye, like, eye bottle holders with that. Um, there is also a really cool guy on Instagram that will make anything adapted. I will reach out to him. Um, I'll do a little homework and I'll reach out to him and see if that's something that he would be willing to consider making. Um, because I think that would be nice for everyone to have. And if it is, then I will actually include that link in my after visit email that I send to you all. I will work on that and, and see if I can make that happen because I love that you brought that forward so that we can make it more accessible for everyone to be able to do it. Thank you for that one, Eric. Okay. Perfect. I will do that. Okay. So uh, another question that I got was, well, why, why not the why not use the drops that, with preservative? I actually got this from a physician um, who said that preservative, the drops that have preservative in, in them are much cheaper than the regular drops. So why not just use the preservative drops? Again, it comes back to we're having a discussion about we. People using eye drops with ALS use drops much, much, much more frequently, as well as for a longer extended period of time 
than somebody who is just using them for everyday use, okay? Um, the preservative within the drop can, in fact, irritate your eye after a long, for after a period of time and can dry your eye out too. So it becomes a little counterproductive. Now, if you can't afford your, uh, like a preservative free drop um, and really want them, consider talking to your ALS chapter, whether it's association or united both, because they do have grants and that is something that you could ask them if they would be willing to help you to, to afford those. Absolutely. So please consider talking to your ALS team about that. Um, the other thing I think that's important to talk about too in relation to preservative free versus a regular drop. Now, uh, there are a couple, there are a couple of brands that a preservative free drop will actually come in just one multi-use drop. But a lot of times it's actually individual little vials that you use and you only use that vial one time and throw that away. Um, one of the benefits to that is the fact that if you have a caregiver, especially for example, if you're in a facility that may not, that may have a high turnover of caregivers or something like that, if they take the bottle and touch your eye, you have the, the risk of bacteria from your eye actually going back up into the bottle. And so it's actually healthier for your eye and your infection risk is less by using the single individual drop bottles versus the multi-use drop bottles. So it's something else to consider. as well. Has anybody, just as a quick question, has anybody on the call had some issues with dry eye or had a client that had some issues with dry eye that you recommended some sort of eye health regimen for and it did an improvement or it didn't? I would love to hear, I, Jill, I saw you shaking your head. <laughs> Do you mind sharing with us? Like, have you had any successes? What have you, what were your experiences? You know, Trinity, what was helpful with my guy, because they really are that amazing team that takes on anything you recommend, they're going to do it and they're going to do it just the way you said to do it. And for him, it actually wasn't well soft that his is truly positioning because he's not comfortable at all in his wheelchair and in his, um, his recliner is challenging. I mean, so it, we had to really contort his, his mount to finally get that, um, so it wasn't the thing that solved all the problems, but it solved some of the problems. It was because uh, he's he's what I would call a power user. So he's really great at hitting very tiny targets on his screen and and that helped pull him back. So that combo of the of the eye drops and the mount configuration seemed to make the difference. Fabulous. And, you know, I think, and Jill, thank you for sharing that, because I think you're right. This is not an end all be all answer, but this is something that gets overlooked very easily that can have such a huge impact. And I think as our pals, as, as people who are living with ALS are in fact living longer, this is something that is going to become more of an issue that we have to pay attention to. And if we can stop and think like that, you know, there's a lot about ALS that we can't, that we can't make better, that we don't have control over. But if we do have control over being able to say to you, like, we need to protect your eyes now because you're probably, you know, you're living longer and we want to make sure that those eyes stay healthy so that in the future, that that's not your limitation that we could have possibly fixed with something as simple as an eye drop from Amazon. So I think it's really important. Trinity, I do just want to say that I think Lane has really helped me also because she's preached the gospel of eye drops. <laughs> so I'm definitely always introducing it. But um, you made a statement that this is something that if you're proactive with it can actually prevent problems and damage in the future. I think that's a big one. I think people will really listen to that and hear that. And, and I, you know, I share this with everyone, not just with our pals, just with all of my folks who are using it, even the littles, it seems to make a difference. It really does. I, I absolutely agree. I mean, I think, you know, yes, we are talking about people with ALS because that's what we do. We, oh, you know, we help. But this is the same for somebody who has cerebral palsy. This is the same for somebody else who has, a, a, you know, an acquired brain injury. 
using eye gaze, making sure your eye health stays in place because this is your form of communication is important for everyone. Um, without a doubt it is, it's the same thing, for example, as, you know, using a splint, using a brace, all of those things. It is absolutely imperative for us to start talking about this in the long run. Um, Lynn had another uh, question slash statement. I have been concerned with nystagmus. One resident said I had it, and then two said that I didn't. Nakam, do you want to talk about eye movement, nystagmus, kind of that sort of motor impairment stuff? Okay. I mean, it is uh, it is sometimes challenging to use an eye tracker if there's a nystagmus. Uh, I guess I, I'm wondering why they why one would say yes and two would say not. I guess one saw it, one didn't. Um, it's there are some there are some common ways to uh, address an astigmatism with the eye tracker. Sometimes it's by having a, a quicker dwell time that sort of beats out the astigmatism. But um, that one needs a lot more. That needs some personal attention to review and see exactly what's going on. Also, certain eye trackers would allow us to see more closely your eye to be able to see if there really is an astigmatism or not. And that would probably be helpful. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Does anybody else have any? Trinity, uh, it's Eddie. I just wanted you to uh, maybe make a comment about uh, compresses, worn compresses on the eye, yes, but rubbing can be a problem. You want to just uh, speak to that? Yes, I will speak to that. <laughs> um, and Nachum, I did not see that question. I just want you to be very clear about that. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, compresses, yeah. So compresses are, uh, we have not had as many of our clients use compresses as they have used with eye drops. So that's where we feel really strongly hanging our hat on that versus the discussion of compresses. But for our clients who have had some significant eye issues, especially involving along the lash lines, okay? So along the lash lines, they're really red, they're crusty. These are people that have oftentimes gone to actually see a physician because you can't not see what's happening. The recommendation has been to use a warm compress, okay? And sometimes people will do like one at a time so they can keep one eye open to be able to communicate versus somebody just blindfolding you. Um, the idea behind that is it helps to uh, warm up the oil glands along the, the lash line so that you can then kind of clear the crusty stuff off as well as allowing that uh, oil then to be able to hear to be able to um, have that oil coat the surface of your eye, keeping your um, tears in place. So that, so, but the big thing that Eddie is speaking of is if you already have a dry corneal surface, which is the surface of the eye across um, everything. Um, so you've got the surface of the eye being dry and then a caregiver comes by and rubs the surface of the eye you are at a very high risk for an ulcer or a, you know, like a scratch or something like that across the surface of your eye. If you have dry eye, please, please, please be careful your own self, be careful as a caregiver to not rub the surface of the eye. And even though like I'm talking like even rubbing the eyelid over the surface of the eye, that is not a safe thing to do. You can, you know, touch, but do not rub. You are at a very high risk for creating a corneal ulcer, which is what we want to avoid because the scar tissue then builds up, the surface of the eye changes, and then you have if, issues with accessing the, your eye gaze device because the glint is not consistent. And just to add to that, um, but uh, an eye doctor may tell you when you apply the artificial tears, the eye drops, they may tell you to do that just to make sure that the moisture is across the entire eye. So you have to just know when and when not to, which is, yeah. yeah. Just avoid rubbing. That's the important part. Avoid the rub. 
Okay. Do we have any other questions at this time? So blepharitis, blepharitis is the is the irritation um, and uh, along the edges of the eyelid. That's what I was speaking of, that kind of red, crusty irritation along the edges, as well as the redness of the eyelids can often happen. Um, so my question to you would be, um, what kind of eye drops um, are you using? Okay, so um, right now they gave him like um, antibiotic eye drops and for uh, hydration, they gave him the non, um, without, um, the ones you just said, the hydrating ones that don't have preservatives, preservative-free hydrating. Um, and um, he told me that his sensitivity and his dry eye was, was like a consequence of the lefortitis. So, um, we we're trying that, but it's been, this is the third week and I don't see, um, that much of improvement. He has been using eye gaze 24 seven for four years now. He was excellent in doing it, but now we can't communicate well. Um, doctor said that his, uh, cornea was getting scratched because of the dryness. And I've been using eye drops for a long time, about two years now. Uh, we just started with these that are preservative free. And the thing is that I don't know if I could do something with the eye gaze to help him because I can see that he looks at a letter and then it kind of, he's, I, I see he's seeing it and I see the dot, but I don't, I see like it moves, like it's not, you know, like reading, like, and, and we're having problems communicating. Oh, oh. We need to have an appointment. <laughs> yes. That's all. Yes, we do. We do need to have an appointment. And I would recommend that you, you know, talk to your physician about using something that's a little bit thicker. Like we talked about one of the drops um, that kind of moving down the list, um, such as like the Cellulvisc or even going to the lipid emulsion drop to see if one of those might be a little bit better for him. Um, kind of, you know, moving down that thickness list like we talked about. Um, also really paying attention to what he's doing at night. For example, is he closing his eyelids completely at night? Do you need to have a conversation about giving one eye a rest during the day for a period of time with like some ointment and then giving the other eye a rest, you know, for some, some, uh, with, you know, like some covering or taping or, but please talk to your physician about that. What you're experiencing right now is exactly why we're trying to get people on the idea of education much earlier, because this, um, unfortunately, I hate that this has happened to your husband, but this happens to a lot of people with ALS as they're using their device longer and longer. But we would love to have an appointment with you to be able to look at what we can do specifically with his eyes, as well as specifically with his communication device so that we can customize it so it's easier for him to access. And you certainly want to be at the next uh, training of scleral lenses because that could, can be a very good option for mm -hmm. this type of a case. Okay, um, so we have a, we have a question. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, can eye drops ever be overused? We yes. are unaware of any problem with overuse of eye drops, the non -pre the preservative free ones. Um, like we have many clients who have taken them every ten minutes or fifteen minutes throughout the day. We've only seen positive results from that. But um, if we maybe that's a good question for us to pass along to one of our consultants just to double check. Mm -hmm. We actually had this question come up on a referral partner call and um, Dr. Louie, an ophthalmologist, ophthalmologist, I think he is. He's an optometrist. Um, he's optometrist, thank you. Um, he let us know that typically there are very few contraindications to using eye drops long-term. The main thing would be what Trinity talked about earlier with develop, people developing allergies to the preservatives themselves after long-term use. Um, he said that's that would be typically the most common thing that might come up. But other than that, there are very few reasons not to use them. Lynn and, had a, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Lynn had a really good comment. Thank you, Lynn, so much for all of your insightful comments. 
was with non-preservative eye drops, it's important to keep track of the use by date. Absolutely important. Keep track of it. Pay attention to your use by dates and get rid of them. Because as you know, we have had recent recalls of eye drops. So being, you know, so being on top of that and paying attention is really important as well. Okay. Oh, okay. Tamara shared that she has a warming eye mask that gave her husband some relief from his dry eye. Again, mechanism behind that, warm up the oil glands on the lower eyelid, which then allow the oil to coat the surface of the eye, helps to keep the tear layer in place. So for somebody, if this, in this case, for you, I would say, talk to your physician about one of those lipid eye drops because we know that he needs more oil across the surface of his eye. So a lipid eye drop would be a very good conversation to have with your physician to see if one of those would be appropriate. I absolutely love everyone um, sharing all of this information. This is super wonderful. Okay. So we're just about at time. I wanna be mindful of that. Um, if anybody has any less questions, we are here to do to to talk. Remember, I will be sending out an after visit summary email with links to our upcoming training as well as a link to this training. Um, I will also make sure to include the information um, about the accessible eye drop. If I can, if I can work on that, Eric, I will work on that. Um, if I'm able to come through. And then I think we got our information about the fact that you can't overuse them. We are unaware of any contraindications with overusing. So thank you all for joining us today. If you have any other questions, um, we are here to answer. Um, I can stay on for a few more minutes as well as some of my team members if you have any questions. Um, otherwise, you're always welcome to email us at um, info at bridgingvoice.org. If you have any questions, we are here to help. And thank you very much for joining us today. And hopefully you'll join us again next week to talk about scleral lenses. I health 401. Goodbye, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Thank you so much for joining us. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Are you able to log into my computer and see what I need to do to improve my high gaze settings? Yes, we are. How do I arrange that? You can send us an email, info at bridgingvoice.org, Lynn, and we would be happy to uh, get all of your information and then set up a time to meet with you. I'm an engineer. It looks like my tracking is overshooting, which means in a control system, way that the gain is too high. Um, I would ask you questions, but I find just be better with not having other people on the call. <laughs> so really it pertains to like some medications because some of them can make that happen more easily. And um, it really would pay to have an appointment also just to go over what meds did any of did that change recently or was it always like that? I'm not on that many medicines. I don't think really is all does that. Baclofen is the one that we worry about the most. I am on that. Okay. So that's the um, so that's like the one that usually 
because it's a muscle relaxant and uh, the muscle relaxants do relax the muscles in the eyes as well. So what happens is that like um, either there's some general inaccuracy where like you're trying, you're focusing so much on a particular target, but you see the like dwell indicator, like going between letters and overshooting is also another thing because you're going, you have some momentum going one way and to stop it takes a little more muscle and you can't stop it quick enough. So that's that's a more typical reason for it. Um, uh, and, and it's hard to even know based on the dosage because some people are more sensitive to even 10 milligrams of baclofen. Some people could be on the official maximum dose of 80 milligrams and it doesn't affect them at all. So it's hard to know, but the muscle relaxants are usually the ones that we blame for that. So I right said- now, oh. Right now, the targeting circle is dead on, but with the little cursor in the middle, doesn't come up in the middle. It's on the edge of the circle. It's very frustrating. So making an appointment with us is really important for us to be able to log in and actually see what's happening. So I did send you a direct chat link, just saying again with our uh, info at bridgingvoice.org. Just let us know that you'd like to see us and then we will uh, contact you and get you scheduled for a session with us. Okay, thank you. You're very oh. welcome. Thank you for joining us today. It was well, wonderful to have you. Perfect. I'm going to say goodbye to everyone. Have a fabulous uh, week. We look forward to hearing from you and hopefully we'll see you next month. Bye-bye, everyone.